get all the way into this. Uh, to that point, uh, sometimes you write a tort proposal. Hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> and then the talk ends up coming out completely different to how you imagined it. And this is one of those, so I really, really hope you like it. Uh, this is type context. Let's get started. Founding a software startup is hard. Building a Java 2 enterprise application is hard. Building a physical server, taking it down to the data center, wiring the network in, and configuring it to work is a real pain in the ass. And thousands and thousands of lines of XML configuration to get my application working in production using Apache Tomcat is a nightmare. If I walked into a VC office in 2017 and told them that was my plan to build a new software startup, I would be summarily laughed out of the room. We've spent years developing infrastructure as a service companies like DigitalOcean, platform as a service companies like Heroku to ensure that no developer ever again has to go to a data center to put an application on the internet. We've built frameworks like Rails and Django to ensure that we don't have to write thousands and thousands of lines of configuration to write an application these days. The technology has moved on. But in the 2000s, in the late 90s, this would have been a completely reasonable position. You have to remember, these are the kinds of times when people were set having adverts like nobody ever got fired for buying IBM and taking them seriously. And the thing is, in 2017, it's easy to kind of laugh and mock the people that were making these technology choices. But the truth is, like these were clever, clever people and they were working incredibly hard to build the internet as it is today to actually function. And in some cases, these people now have more money than any of us could ever imagine. The point is this. When we're working in software engineering, context changes. Over the multiple decades of a normal software engineering career, the trends of the industry will change. The companies that you work at will change. They'll grow. They'll reconfigure. And if you aren't able to keep up with that change as you're working in them, then your career will be more damaged than those who can. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about Ruby. I think it's really easy to be comfortable as a Ruby programmer. It's been a popular programming language now for about a decade, and I suspect the longest serving Ruby programmers in the room will have been programming it for just about that long. And there are a bunch of reasons why it can be comfortable to be a Ruby programmer. But I think one of the biggest ones is just the completely varied domains that we now have Rails applications built in. I've worked in everything from healthcare to children's books publishing to the cloud, dating websites, music analysis. Like, you can build anything with Ruby, and the truth is people do. So you're able to sort of move from industry to industry. and. If you know how Ruby works, if you know how Rails works, you're able to very quickly pick up like, what is going on in that application because we have these conventions for how we structure code. We've thought very, very hard about what we're, how we're going to lay out objects on the file system, how we're going to actually uh, write the tools that we work with. And that is to our advantage. If I was going to build a new software as a service application, in 2017, I'd be pulling a set of moves that I've done so many times that they are now hard-coded into my fingers. I'd type a Rails new, and an application would get breathed into life. I'd generate some scaffolds, and those would give me all of my basic functionality. And then I'd sprinkle in a few gems, add some CSS, make a few tweaks. And I'd be basically done. In that short period of time, as little effort as that, I'd have built an application that can actually start throwing off money. And I think that is to Rails's credit, that it has become this thing that enables us to, faster than literally anything else in the world, build applications, get them up and running, and actually provide value to the world. But Ruby and Rails is more than that. It's not just this incredible productivity. It's this mentality. It's this community. It's the group of people in this room who have come together today to actually talk about what we value, who our community is, and where we're going to be going. This shows in many places, but I think more, one more perhaps than others is the 
code that we write in most Rails apps. It's incredibly common to see code that looks exactly like this. This is just the scaffolded Rails default controller. I haven't made any changes here apart from one line, which is validate people team, which just checks that you're a member of the people team at DigitalOcean. And this application is in production today, serving real web traffic and providing real value. Rails gives us this incredible power to write basically no code and provide actual business value, which is something that is great to sell to business people, because they're like, our developers, they're just insanely productive, it's amazing. But as I'm sure you all know, not all Rails applications look like this. Sometimes they look much more like this, where we have a big unending mess of unpacking params, newing up objects, making other things, doing selection, doing slices. And as a Ruby developer, I look at this and I'm like, this is not great Ruby-like code. We have standards in our community for things like what is too much code, when to refactor, when to split things apart. We have developed these instincts for when to make our code smaller. And as somebody who's been a proficient Ruby programmer for a number of years now working on popular open source, I have well-formed instincts about how I would refactor this. But if you're a newer developer, this may seem incredibly daunting to you. And that's fine too, because our community has spent years developing tutorials, talks by people like Ben Orenstein, Katrina Owen, Sandy Metz on how to refactor. We've written books and resources, and there's so much in there. And to me, this points to the fact that we are a community that deeply, deeply values learning from each other, teaching, testing, teaching, refactoring, teaching us how to improve the code that we write. When you come into the Ruby community via one of the code schools or boot camps today, one of the first things that they will teach you is test-driven development. And that's a function of trying to help you understand how to write software that works and software that is quality. And I'm not saying that TDD always results in well-factored software. That would be a fallacy. But it is a useful crutch for beginners. And I think that we're here teaching that, to me, indicates that this is a community that deeply, deeply cares about software quality, or at least likes to claim that we do. I'm sure there are people in this room who are working on Rails apps that they're not madly in love with, that they have to upgrade, that the deploy times for are annoying, that there's that one messy god object called user.rb that has been unprecedented. And the thing is, we create those messes for a reason. We create them because we're in a context, our business demands that we ship something quickly in order to be able to provide some value or meet some deadline. And I think for the most part, we'd all agree that we'd like to come back and refactor it later. This is all to say that when you want to describe what a good Rails application is, I think a reasonable answer is a well-factored monolith. It's big, but it's easy to work with. There's probably one massive database at the core of it, and you're talking to that to do all of the operations that you want to do. And we as a community, for the most part, is, end up building these things before we build anything else. And so that's interesting, right? Who does this actually suit? Why have we come to building this as our sol primary solution for what a good, large app that lots of people work on looks like? And to me, it has a, uh, something to do with a function of the age of the community and something with a function of business context. So it is generally true that there are more smaller companies than there are bigger companies. And Rails has only really been popular for about five, six, if I'm being generous, seven years at this point. And that naturally means that we're to the left-hand side of this curve. Our companies are smaller. Most of them have either begun to be runaway successes, but that's the exception. Many, many more have died. And that means that our ecosystem, this tooling, this ideal case that I'm talking about, is implicitly created for people with those smaller contexts. But the question is, well, Rails has been around for 10 years now, and we've had a few runaway successes. And a few of them are represented in this room, companies like Heroku, GitHub, Optoro, uh, to name a few. And that's Rails in the big, and not many people are doing that yet. And I think it's not great, actually. And so I wanted to posit the question, like, how are we going to make Rails great for the people that survive? 
like, if Ruby is going to become more and more popular and the probability of a Ruby app succeeding in 2017 is higher than it's ever been before, that means our tools are going to necessarily have to suit bigger and better use cases. Earlier, Kerry said it's great to use Ruby until something about Ruby is no longer correct for your system. And I think more and more of us are going to begin to face that every single day. So the question I'd like to sort of spend the next 10 minutes answering is how can we make Ruby better for bigger teams? And to do that, I'd like to go away and introspect other languages and other communities. I hate to be that guy, but it's time for a gopher at a Ruby conference. And there's a reason for this, right? The Go programming language was created by Google to solve engineering problems for Google's engineering organization. The Google engineering organization is so big that not only are they definitely bigger than any individual engineering organization represented in this room, I'd be willing to bet they're bigger than the sum of all the engineering organizations represented in this room, except there's the one guy from the US government. <laughs> which I did not plan for when practicing this talk. Um, and the, co the other piece of context that's really important to understand is who Google is hiring. They're hiring thousands and thousands of fresh college graduates every single year. And that's a completely different context to most of us. When you look at Ruby positions today, it's mostly, oh my god, we want to hire seniors. We need all the seniors. Give me every senior. And it's like, that's not a realistic hiring pool. And so if these people are building software where they're in an engineering organization so large that they're consuming systems that from people they may never talk to, even though they work at the same company, that's an interesting problem. Now, I'm not saying we should all immediately go and build everything at Google scale. We don't all have Google's problems. But it is interesting to look at what they're doing and maybe why they're doing it. One place that I like to start is forced error handling. And that's because it's something that we as a community aren't super interested in. Ruby is literally a happy path obsessed ecosystem. It's built right into the definition of what the programming language is for. Ruby is to make programmers happy. But if we can't really be happy if we're having errors in production that are causing our system to crash and having a bad time. How many of you have an exception tracking system in production like Sentry in order to prevent your application from crashing? And the reason this happens in Ruby is like a sort of perfect storm of where the language comes from. Any operation that performs input or output from our system can fail at any time for any reason. If we're calling out to Stripe, if we have a database, some kind of metrics or reporting system, that communication can blow up. But in order for me to know how it's going to blow up, Either somebody has to document all of the exceptions a call can possibly throw, or I have to read all of the source code that's present to do that. And if we're talking about many complicated, nested, distributed systems, that's going to take much more time than I can possibly achieve. Go looks at this differently. In Go, errors are values. And you have to actually deal with the error in order for your program to compile at all. This can be as simple as, you return to 404, I check that it's a 404, don't really care and move on. Or it could be that I blow up my entire system. Either way, I'm forced to do something about it. And throughout Go programs, you see error checking rife everywhere. But that's a difference, but not an answer to why is this important for programming with large teams. And I've sort of boiled it down to this idea that what's happening is the machine is communicating intent on the human's behalf. And this pattern is actually scalable. Machines scale, humans don't. And if you can push more context in front of a human when they're writing code, that's much better than having to keep documentation up to date, having to communicate over Slack, having to bother somebody, because it's built in right there, and you're able to see it immediately without having to do any further detail. So let's imagine like how we could build forced error checking into Ruby. Like, can we actually make this happen? And the example that I have is a like simple wrapper. Let's imagine we're using Faraday, handing it a URL, calling get on that URL, and doing something with it. If I want to load a page, I have to know that Faraday client error is the base error type that Faraday is going to return to me. I like deal with that however I'm going to do it if my get fails. 
But if I'm a newer Ruby developer and I haven't read the Faraday documentation, this might lead to exceptions in production. And in fact, very recently at DigitalOcean completely did because the downstream HTTP system was down. After having spent some time thinking about what the cause of this was, I was like, we need a better way to systemically deal with errors in our HTTP clients. And so we appended two extra arguments to a function that looked like this, on success and on failure. These are required keyword arguments. Now, if I successfully load the web page, I can delegate that onto my on success call. But if I fail, I'm going to invoke the on failure call. Now, if I'm dealing with someone who is not a Ruby programmer but is working in the system, they are forced to admit that an exception can be raised, even though they didn't know that was even a thing that could happen. And so by doing this, we've actually communicated some systemic intent to our programmers. I think it would be really great if we sort of took a pattern like this, not necessarily this pattern, but something of this idea where we're forcing developers to admit errors can happen and make them deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. The other one I wanted to talk about is the Go context object. And I've used that word a lot in this talk, but this refers to something extremely specific. Context is an object in the Go system which is designed to build up state as it's passed from the beginning of a call through to the end of a call. And you actually see when you're programming in Go, this like context object is being passed through just basically every call that happens in the system. And there's a reason for that. It's used to hydrate things like request IDs, timestamps, the current user, and then you build all of that information together to do logging and auditing and metrics. How many of you have taken an application with Rails logs and had to SSH into a box and like tail a log file to work out what's going on, but your out of record calls don't happen to include all of the IDs that were passed in a request and something has exploded? It's infuriating. This pattern, this idea of having a blob of state which absorbs stuff as we go through the system passed all the way down, enables us to do things like know which requests cause which database calls. We get to know which third party services are being invoked at the right time. And that's a really powerful construct. By having all of this extra information that's around everywhere, not just in places that have the request available to them, you're able to build a much more robust and reliable system. I don't want to show you like how I would implement this because it's a lot of code and frankly not of that much interest, but I will be tweeting out my library that does it after the talk. So to sort of quickly finish and summarize, code bases reflect organizations, but I think open source ecosystems reflect the average organization that's present. My bet is that over the next five years, the people who are saying Ruby is dead are saying it because they've seen organizations grow faster than the Rails ecosystem is designed to scale to teams of that size. But I don't think that needs to be the case. I think we really can like, show that Rails can work in a world where we have thousands of developers, tens of thousands of developers, all working on a single code base. So that's basically everything that I had. As Jim said, I work for DigitalOcean. Uh, we are hiring. They were nice enough to send me here, so I'm morally obliged to say that. Um, and yeah, that really is all that I've got. Uh, thank you very much, Twitter, email. I will take questions for the next few minutes or so, if anyone has any. Great, no questions. Thank you very much.